Hello, I'm Pete Dory. I'm Professor of British Politics at Cardiff University, based in the School of Law and Politics at Cardiff. And I'm going to talk today about the House of Lords, uh, its relationship to the House of Commons, uh, what it does, who its members are, and why or how it might be reformed in the future. The first thing to note is that because Britain does not have a written constitution, the House of Lords has evolved over centuries and particularly over the last 150 years. That means that its role and its relationship to the House of Commons has gradually changed, not because of some codified document stating what its role is, but because of gradual custom and practice, reforms on a gradual basis, and its power being whittled away. The thing to note here is straight away is that the House of Lords is recognised by virtually everybody as being subordinate to or junior to the House of Commons because the House of Commons is directly elected, the House of Lords is not. And of course the question will be, which we'll consider later on, is why it is still in the 21st century we have an institution which is not elected. Some would argue this is totally wrong, others argue that not being elected is actually a strength which enables the House of Lords to fulfil its role more efficiently and more effectively. And I'll be looking at that later on. What has happened over the last 150 years is that the power of the House of Lords has declined gradually, as I indicated. And it's declined gradually through probably five main developments. In 1911, legislation was passed by a Liberal government, the 1911 Parliament Act, which introduced a veto on the ability of the House of Lords to block government legislation. So if the House of Commons passed a law, the House of Lords in 1911 could only then veto it for two years. After two years, that law would become effective regardless of the House of Lords opposing it. The same 1911 Parliament Act also removed completely the House of Lords' ability to block what's called financial legislation, most notably the budget passed by the government. So that is a major curb or constraint on the power of the House of Lords. And the 1911 Parliament Act was clearly indicating that the House of Commons was now the supreme House of Parliament, not the House of Lords. Then in 1945-46, Again, there wasn't a specific date, it was a kind of gradual process. But during 1945 and 1946, what was called the Salisbury Doctrine was introduced. What occasioned this was the fact that in 1945, a Labour government was elected with a massive majority. And the concern was that the House of Lords, which in those days was dominated by the Conservative Party, might try to block or veto for up to two years at a time, the legislation introduced by the Labour government in the House of Commons. Recognising the danger of this and the fact that it might bring the House of Lords into disrepute, the Conservative leader in the House of Lords, Lord Salisbury, agreed that the House of Lords would not try to block legislation passed by the House of Commons, effectively by the Labour government in the House of Commons, if that legislation had been pledged or promised in the government's election manifesto. And that Salisbury Doctrine therefore laid down the principle that a policy or a measure included in a governing party's election manifesto would not be blocked by the House of Lords because that would be completely undemocratic. So again, therefore, the House of Lords is exercising self-restraint in agreeing that it would defer to the wishes of the governing party in the House of Commons because that governing party had been elected by the people. In 1949, regardless of that Salisbury Doctrine, the Labour government also introduced a further veto power of one year. So that power of delay the House of Lords had of two years was reduced in 1949 to one year only. It could only block legislation passed by the government in the House of Commons for a maximum of one year. If the same law was passed or introduced again a year later, the House of Lords would have to let it go through. Again, this is an example of how the House of Commons was asserting its dominance over the House of Lords. All three of those reforms, 1911, 
1945 to 46 and 1949 were concerned to curb the power, the power of veto of the House of Lords. What they didn't do, but what came later, was change the composition or membership of the House of Lords. And the first of two changes occurred subsequently. In 1958, there was a crucial bill passed by a Conservative government, the 1958 Life Peerage Act. And the Life Peerage Act allowed the creation of new peers who would have their title and thus their right to sit in the House of Lords for, for the duration of their lifetime. They would not pass their title on to their, their heirs or their offspring. So unlike hereditary peers, where the title was passed down from generation to generation, the life peers said that when that person died, the title died with them. But the crucial factor here is that the Life Peerage Act allowed for a much wider variety of people to be awarded peerages and therefore sit in the House of Lords. People would be given peerages under the 1958 Life Peerage Act as recognition for maybe a lifetime of achievement in their career. They may have been a successful politician, a successful, a successful scientist, successful academic. And in that situation, therefore, they'd be rewarded with a life peerage. And what that did, and I'll return to this later on, is it infused the House of Lords with new blood, with a new level of expertise. The people in the House of Lords with life peerages would often speak in debates and conduct scrutiny of government legislation with much greater expertise and authority than the unelected hereditary peers who had simply inherited their title by an accident of birth. The other major change to membership was in 1999 when the new Labour government led by Tony Blair abolished all except 92 hereditary peers. Now for Labour in particular, the problem with hereditary peers was they were virtually all conservatives because they tend to be linked to the aristocracy. People who inherited their titles and their lands and their country estates and passed them down the family line. And Labour in particular, perhaps understandably, always objected very strongly to being faced with her House of Lords dominated numerically by predominantly conservative voting hereditary peers, often very wealthy, often aristocrats, often landowners, with very conservative, with a small c and a large c point of view. One other thing also which should be noted about the hereditary peerage system was that the titles invariably only passed down the male line. In other words, women did not inherit the titles. When a man with a title died, it was his eldest son who inherited the title. So in that context, therefore, when the House of Lords was dominated by hereditary peers, as it was up until 1999 in particular, not only as it were, was it unelected and therefore also uh, predominantly conservative, it was also male-dominated, that there had been very few women in the House of Lords. So it was unrepresented, therefore, both in terms of gender and political balance. So the 1999 uh, House of Lords Act, therefore, removed all but 92. 92 hereditary peers were allowed to remain as a concession to the Conservatives who agreed that it allowed the change to be made if 92 hereditary peers remained. So again, there was a degree of compromise there. Labour said to the House, the House of Lords and the Conservative Party, if you, as it were, let the legislation go through, we'll allow 92 it appears to remain for the foreseeable future. So it's a cl cl sort of classic British compromise, really, as it were. The parties giving and taking and making concessions to each other to get the change through. But in all these ways, therefore, we can see that the House of Lords, in terms of its powers and its membership, has changed gradually over the last 150 years to the present situation, whereby the House of Lords is acknowledged by everybody to be subordinate to the House of Commons because the House of Commons is elected, the House of Lords is not. And therefore, in many occasions, on many instances, where there's disputes between the House of Lords and House of Commons, the House of Lords usually defers to the House of Commons. It recognises the House of Commons has a democratic legitimacy 
which the House of Lords, by virtue of being appointed, lacked.